Crabs, Journal 8. I returned to the world slowly, keeping my eyes closed through wakefulness. It was almost complete. I could smell the damp, still pine-scented air, and the unique smell of wet nylon. The sounds of falling water surrounded me. Big, well-placed, well-spaced plops from the tall pine that stretched above the tent in delicate drips onto the tent fly. I opened my eyes. The inside of the tent was filled with a warm, thin, rosy light as daylight was filtered by the orange walls of the tent. I lifted the flap to find a gray, rainy day outside. The lake was tea-colored and calm. I was warm and cozy inside the down sleeping bag. But as wakefulness came, it brought a variety of aches and pains. My body had a work hangover that would win prizes. And the edges of the rocks and roots under the nylon floor of the tent didn't help. I snuggled deeper and dozed again. But I couldn't sleep. After a while, I got out of the cocoon and crawled into the day. I tied back the tent flaps and looked around. Gray, close, wet. It was the kind of day you'd like to spend in bed with an interesting novel and a bit of silent sand to help you keep away the meanies. I had brought no booze, but the rest of the plan sounded good. First, I ambled back into the bush a little ways, muscles complaining the whole way. The soggy, needle-covered ground was dead quiet. While I was taking a leak, I looked around and saw some strange animal droppings, almost like cow flaps, all over the place. But there were no cows around here. I took no further notice and went back to the campsite. Foresight has never been a strong point with me, as I was reminded when I started to rummage around in the packs. I left the one holding the equipment wide open last night, and now it was soaked inside and out. One of the food packs had come partially open with all the handling from the day before, and the rain had invaded it too. The first, the few thick novels I'd packed were sopping wet all through. The pages separated when I tried to turn them. No booze, and now no books. This trip was going to be a challenge. My snacks were wet too. Since swimming peanuts have never been my favorite food, I scattered a half pound of them around for the squirrels and dug out a tin of smoked herring and a bag of chocolate dreams. Then I retied the packs, took a long drink from the lake, and hauled my aching frame back into the tent. With my boots off and stashed in the front corner of the tent, I climbed back into the bag and managed to pack it around me in such a way that I could sit cross-legged with my arms free. I peeled back the lid of the kipper can and gorged on the oily fish, stuffing the morsels into my mouth with my fingers. Boy, what a classy guy. But I was famished. I managed in my talented way to spill fish oil on my sleeping bag, the tent floor and the ground in front of the tent. Otherwise, I was very neat. The chocolates tasted dreamy, as advertised in the label. I munched through half the bag and stuffed the rest into one of my boots. Then I did something I'd never done. Before, never done. I just sat and looked out through the rain across the campsite, past the well-spaced pines and over the lake. My mind was unusually calm. Little wavelets of thought rippled across it, leaving no trace. It was nice. It was nice to sit and look away at nothing in particular, because ordinarily my mind felt like a telephone exchange, constantly jabbed and zapped by frantic messages. Test coming Monday. Mother mad again. Project due two days ago. Kids laughing behind me in the halls. On and on, over and over. Current never turned off. Switchboard never shut down. Messages unanswered. Circuits overloaded. But here I noticed the millions of tiny currents that streaked the surface of the dark water. The far shore was a soft, dark gray line. Shreds of cloud changed shape quickly, moving across the somber sky. Water, land, and sky were blended together, unified by the hiss of the rain. Imagine I thought all these thoughts as I sat like a skinny, aching Buddha in my orange, little orange cave. Tough crab, who hated city rain because all it did was move the grime from one place to another. Resting in that orange tent, I looked out into a very small world, shut off by rain and distance. I was contented. I was even almost happy. I was also tired, so I rolled over and fell asleep. I woke up with a start from a dream troubled by dark wings. One of those nightmares that leaves you with no memory, only fear. The tent flaps were still open, and, and though, through them lay a black night like a wall. It was dead silent. No wind, no dripping rain. The air was chilly and damp. Rolling onto my back, I pulled the bag around my neck and stared at the tent roof. I couldn't shake the feeling of foreboding that had enclosed me as if it were part of the night air. Had I had a nightmare brought on by the food I ate just before sleep? I remembered nothing. Anxiety attacks were not new to me. They had introduced me to Silent Sand and visited me regularly. But this was different. 
This was a dark, nameless fear that I seemed to breathe in with each breath. And I could hear nothing and see nothing. My senses were useless. Then a strange sound separated itself from the night. A soft tearing sound off in the woods behind me, like the ripping of wet paper. Then nothing, only my breathing. My heartbeat picked up. I strained to hear and to see. Another sound, different, closer, a brushing noise. Then, as one slowly becomes aware of a rising breeze, I felt an eerie huffing sound, almost like the snort of a pig, but not as sharp, or the pant of a dog, but more threatening. It was rhythmical. It got slowly louder. A twig snapped back of the tent. One of the guy lines jerked. By now my pulse was hammering in my ears, but I could still follow the movement of the huffing noise from behind the tent along the side, coming closer and louder. I jerked up onto one elbow as a searing terror burned through me. A shape blacker than the night loomed in the doorway. The huffing was loud now as the shape pumped stinking breath into the tent. I was paralyzed convinced that some shaggy monster had shambled from a horrible fairy tale to tear my flesh and break my bones. The shape stopped moving. Oh God, oh God, I chanted, my eyes fixed in the shape. The air inside the tent reeked from the foul odor. Unable to keep still any longer, I shrieked and tried to scramble to the back wall of the tent. The shape leapt at me, snarling. I felt sharp claws through the sleeping bag dragging me backwards. Instinctively, I rolled into a ball, whimpering, no, 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 and kept still. The claws withdrew. Another snarl filled the tent as I was seized again and partially rolled over. Eyes squeezed shut, jaws clamped closed as in a seizure. I stopped breathing, petrified. I must have fainted. For how long, I don't know. But when I came to again, it was light, the half-light of an overcast dawn. I was lying half in, half out of the tent, my head resting on my arm. The stench around me was, was awful, almost physical. I then realized I had thrown up. My head and arm were lying in sticky vomit. I got up on one elbow and threw up again in painful spasms until nothing more came. My stomach continued to heave and I lay back down, head on arm. A few minutes later, still panting from terror and the heaving, I struggled to a sitting position at the door of the tent. I saw the sleeping bag twisted and rolled into a corner. Down covered everything like gray snow. One of my boots was missing. The other had been chewed around the top. The candy bag was ripped and empty. Turning my head, I looked over the campsite. Nothing there, except a brown, smelly pile of the same animal droppings I'd seen in the bush. Then I noticed that the food packs had been dragged around a little, but neither had been torn open. When I got to my hands and knees, I realized with disgust that sometime during my ordeal, my bowels had emptied a liquid, stinking mess into my pants and down both legs. I had pissed myself, too. The disgusting stench of myself nauseated me further, and I began to retch again as I crawled toward the lake. Slowly looking fearfully around, for I half expected to be attacked again, I removed my clothing. I searched for claw marks, but found nothing. At last, I sat naked at the edge of the lake, like a newborn baby, weak, scared, and dirty. After a few minutes, I stood and shakily waded into the cold, numbing water. I washed myself clean of my own filth, sweat, and fear. The clouds began to lift and allowed the sun to bring a little warmth. After I washed, I lay on the flat granite shingle. Slowly, the sun warmed the fear out of me. Relief replaced it. I was still alive. I had been certain I was going to die, torn and chewed by a black bear. I guess that's what it had to be. My remains left to rot alone in the bush. Somehow, I'm not sure why, dying like that scared me more than a glorious death in a battlefield or a bicycle race or something like that. It sounds crazy, I know. After all, if you're dead, you're dead. Anywhere, anyway, there I was, lying naked on a rock at the edge of a lake whose name I didn't know. I closed my eyes against the sun. A light breeze skimmed my skin, moving the hair on my legs, belly, and chest. I could feel the grit of sand grains between me and the cool granite, and my skin took on a lazy glow from the sun. I heard the peaceful lap of wavelets on the shore and the sound of the breeze in the pines overhead. Bird song, at least four or five different kinds, sprinkled with air. I slept. A short time later, I awoke, hungry and very thirsty. Scooping up cold lake water, I gulped it greedily down. Soon I was dressed with a full stomach, loading the canoe. I wanted out of that horrible place as soon as possible. I left my old clothing behind me and pushed out onto the calm lake in bright afternoon sunshine. I don't know why, 
but I felt new, as if, the, if this was the real start of my journey. Of course, I didn't know where I was going, but one thing I was sure of, I would sleep on islands from now on. And late that afternoon, I found an island on the same lake, but hours of the crab zigzag further on. It was shaped like a wedge, high on one end, and tapering down to a nice little sand beach flanked with young birches. When I had unloaded the canoe, beached it, turned it over, and stored the paddles underneath, it was dusk. I turned and looked back down the lake to the other campsite, but it was hidden by a point of land which tur- jutted into the lake. Good. The sooner I forgot that place, the better. I was pretty dragged out and decided to hit the sack early. Stars were beginning to show themselves in the darkening sky, and there were no clouds. I figured I'd sleep out in the open. I found my bag torn and still damp and soiled in a couple of places by vomit, climbed in, folding the dirty patches under, and fell asleep. The sun woke me, already high in the sky. I put on a pair of shorts after washing in the lake and got to work. There was a lot to do. First, I unpacked everything. I laid out all the food, what seemed like an endless supply of cans, on the gravel near the water's edge. Next came my wardrobe, a small one now, then all the equipment. I looked it all over. Everything was wet. Some of the equipment, like cooking pots, was dented from rough handling and bad packing. Cereal was leaking from squash boxes. I took a length of quarter-inch rope and strung it between two thick pines. I had to experiment with, my, with the knots so the line wouldn't droop. Then I hung up my clothes, the canvas packs, soggy and stiff. I hung from broken branches. The tent was, the tent was hauled into the lake for a good washing. It was ripped a little around the door and back wall, but not too badly. I figured it would dry best if I pitched it, so I did that. I got a pot of dirty water, a pot of water to rinse the sleeping bag, dipping the dirty patches in, soaping them, rinsing again. That took ages, because I had to be careful not to get the down too wet. After spreading it over a low bush in the sun, I repacked the food in some sort of an organized fashion, so the packs could be carried without giving me a hernia. All this made me hungry. As the afternoon wore on, I began to picture and to taste a thick, savory beef stew with rich brown gravy. But when I found the matches, my vision disappeared. I had lots of matches all right. Paper ones. Fifty packets of paper matches. All soaking wet. Damn it, I thought. And other worse words. My feeling of optimism disappeared in a cold wave. I grabbed a book of matches in desperation. Ripped out a soggy match. Tried to strike it alight. But the red sulfur match had crumbled. The, the sand on the striking patch was torn from the, first, from the paper backing. It was useless. For the first time, as I sat back on the pine-needled ground, I really wanted a drink. Where was Silent Sam when I really needed him? How good it would feel to have him soothing me, dissolving the angles and edges from my anxiety and depression. I ate cold, glutinous, sticky stew that night on a darkening beach, right from the tin. How could I go on without a fire? No heat? No cooking? Not that I could cook worth a damn anyway. No defense. Maybe I'd meet someone, a fisherman maybe, and borrow some. But I wanted to avoid people. That was the reason I was here in the first place. I couldn't turn back. I just couldn't. To go limping home like a fool? The great outdoorsman? Too stupid to waterproof his matches? I couldn't do it. I get too many, I told you so's, to count. I'd only confirm everyone's opinion that I needed them to run my life for me. I would go on. After all, it was June, warm weather was coming. I could exist on cold food. I went to bed thinking, if I could survive that bear, I could survive anything. By noon next day, I was on my way again, after breakfast of raisin bran and lake water and cold instant coffee partially dissolved. I headed off. 